Thank you very much. It's always intriguing to be the talk right before lunch because everyone has their stomach growling and they want to go. And then when you have a delayed entrance, it even starts it faster. So, so we will try not to dawdle and we'll try to uh, present some of the stuff. Uh, first off, yes, thank you for the introduction. I, I'm from the University of Nevada, Reno in the United States. And some of you probably have no clue where that is. So uh, if you have a map of the United States up here, Nevada is near the far west. Um, I'm actually farther west than Las Vegas and farther west than Los Angeles. <clears throat> um, my city sits at about 1,500 meters. Uh, the mountain up there is about 3,000 meters. We have some beautiful stuff that happens in our city. And uh, up on the mountain, I even get to go skiing during the winter. Uh, so I got to take a picture of my son there. Our campus is situated on the north end of town. During the winter, they have some, some snow, not very often. Um, but this is what campus looks like now with all the greenery and lots of new buildings. And I, when I go back on next week, I will be hooding one of my PhD students out on the, the grass there when we have graduation. <clears throat> So I want to start off by talking about data visualization. And the first question is, what is it? Uh, and really, our goal is to figure out how to represent and present data that can help us see something. We want to be able to spot stuff with our eyes because our, our brain has a very large visual cortex and we can spot things rapidly. And so if we look at data visualization, before I get to forest fires, we've got to talk about how this works. Uh, the first major data visualization was John Snow's map. And in 1854 in London, they had a cholera outbreak. And they had a bunch of people who died. Over 10 days, 500 people died in one neighborhood. And John Snow figured it out by plotting where they were, where they lived. And he was able to figure out it was from a well that was contaminated. And so... Everybody else could not figure it out, but he finally did. So this is considered one of the first data visualization maps. Then there are other maps. If we had time, I could show you in real time, basically where we can plot meteorite strikes across the Earth and see where they are and how big they were. Or if we were studying weather, I could show you wind maps to help us see that certain areas of my country are very high wind and certain areas are very low wind all the time. And therefore we could discuss whether we wanted to have windmills in certain areas to generate electricity. Visualization is also important when we're talking about other research. I've been involved in some mining research to do visualization of whether it be above ground mines, open pit mines or underground mines to show them how to do evacuation. I do visualization with my students to discuss gravity and graphics or a virtual map of my campus so they can take tours of it. <clears throat> and I really got some major interest in visualization when I was at a Desert Research Institute. Uh, DRI is a campus near my university. I was there for a couple of years as a center director of visualization. And we got to build some large visualization facilities. Um, one of those facilities is called a cave. It's basically three meters cube. And there's only about 10 of them in the world. So some of you probably haven't seen the one, but we actually built one. So I had some time lapse of the building of it. And our goal was to have spaces to where we could have a 3D movie on every wall. And you can see things in 3D in front of it. So we were able to put together a large space where we could do it. Uh, there's the weekend time. Then they came back the next week and finished it. Uh, and once we had the walls that could move in and out, we could actually start viewing things in 3D and start going from there. Some of the things we were able to view was uh, a visualization of Lake Tahoe, which is near my campus, where we could fly you around and see things. So this visualization lets us see stuff. In this case, we could do co false color of the imagery and be able to see that there's a golf course up there that I had never golfed on before I saw the map. And so I got to go up there and go see some people golfing. Um, but you start learning things by seeing visualizations, and that's the whole purpose. 
One of the other places, and I won't show a video clip of this, is uh, we were able to put you onto the surface of Mars. Being able to do data visualization and 3D computer graphics lets us take you places you couldn't go. And I was able to work with a professor who does sand dune studies, and he has been through the Sahara and a few other countries, places to be able to map sand dunes. He was able to take 3D radar to go under the sand dunes to find objects under them. And he had been studying a little bit about some of the sand dunes on Mars. And we were able to take him, let's see if I can get my mouse over here, and place him on the ground surface in this crater to see the sand dunes on Mars that were over 25 feet tall in the short ones and much higher in the larger ones. And he was able to actually make some studies and discussions about how that worked. He was really excited. All right. So let me go back to forest fires. Um, <clears throat> in Nevada, we are a drier climate. Um, we are considered partially desert. And when we have trees and there's a fire, they can spread rapidly. So we have an issue of wanting to study how to do them and how to fight them and combat them. So doing data visualization is really not a technology issue. It's more of a people issue. How do we display it so where they can see it and understand it? And if we're going to simulate something, there's a nice quote that I have from a friend of mine that all simulations are wrong. Wow. Think of that part. All simulations are wrong. That's why they're simulations, right? But some simulations are useful. My students put together some simulations of things, and they're not useful sometimes. But your goal is to develop useful simulations that you can use. So I started with some of my students to develop some graphics. We started with an undergraduate group. And they did some basic fire simulations. And they were playing with the graphics, too, learning how to do stuff. And I'm going to skip this for, for sake of time. As you're doing simulations, you have a few basic ways you can simulate fire spreads. One of them is with vector-based stuff, where you do elliptical wave propagation. <clears throat> um, it assumes that there's a, some kind of a homogeneous surface, a flat prairie a grassland. Uh, or you can do raster-based, where you do cellular automaton. And the cellular automaton can run faster, but it lacks the precision. So we've got to come up with ways to do it. We developed a fire spread model that is fractal in nature. Um, it integrates elliptical and raster spread simulations. And this video that's actually running that's hard to see is, uh, let's see if I can get my mouse over here. We started a fire down here, and we're going to watch it spread up this canyon. And we're going to come back to this canyon in a while. So we, we can do fire simulation and spread it there. We've based it upon a lot of the measured work that's in um, several in the literature uh, by Rothermel and Van Wagner and Albini. Um, and so we were able to take this data, put it into the simulation, and run it. We then f feed our simulation with a lot of data sets. Uh, some of the surface fuel models, we have to get the elevation, the slope, which way it's facing, because the, the terrain that is facing the sun dries out faster. So therefore, we have to understand which way it faces. We have to talk about what fuel is on it. Is it just grass? As so we get all this data, typically from satellite imagery, <clears throat> we have to understand the type of trees that are on it, how tall they are. We have to understand that over here, we have to know where the live fuel canopy starts, where the top of the tree height is. And then we have to understand what kind of wind speed we have, because the wind speed is going to impact how fast things move, or the embers when they fly out of trees. <clears throat> we also have to get a lot of other ancillary data, uh, temperatures, what kind of precipitation, um, what kind of fuel moisture. Dry wood burns faster than wet wood. We all understand that. But then you've got to get the data to understand what kind of fuel you have out there in the forest. <clears throat> Um, we've been able to take it and put it together to compute rate of speed, flame lengths, be able to do spotting of the fire when it spots off into the future, uh, doing crown fires where sometimes when the fire gets up into the trees, it will start burning across the top of the trees faster than the bottom and create a whole different environment. Um, we've been able to do time of arrival and spread detections. Um, we focused on Kyle Canyon, which is the picture I showed you before. And it's intriguing because 
you have this canyon, which is a box canyon. This is the ridge line above it. Um, and there's a road at the bottom. There's a lot of expensive homes in that canyon. And so for some reason, the government wanted us to look at that. They, they, they like to do things like that, right? Um, so let's see, I think I have to click on this one. So if we take our trip into Kyle Canyon, we can drop into some of the um, tourist section of the canyon and see what this looks like. We'll first of all go in with Google Maps first, and then we'll drop down onto the canyon road. You can see the canyon walls around there. We'll drop down onto the road and then actually turn on some real life pictures so you can see some of the trees and understand how the fire would impact us. There's actually a ski resort on the other side of that mountain over there, so it's, it's at fairly high elevation, too. And we come down onto the ground. And Google Maps gives you nice pictures, but they don't put trees for you yet. We're doing some research with them on some of that, too. All right, let's change it from this to photos. And you can actually see that we have buildings, we have trees, and there are a lot of trees around that are susceptible to forest fire burns. All right, so <clears throat> we've been able to do a lot of forest uh, asset development, modeling of trees inside of our simulation. We have a couple major type of trees which fit around the area where I live. Um, we have some shrubs, sagebrush, and a few other great basin items. Uh, we have houses that we can identify from some of the solar, from the satellite data. <clears throat> We've added a lot of interactive tools because if you're going to do forest fire simulation, you've got to be able to pause it before you can start visualizing it and change some things. We can start fires once we pause it. We can bring a bulldozer in to bulldoze a spot to clear fuel out to make a fire break. We can have moisture drops to where we can bring a helicopter to drop water onto the fire and help it. So, so we created some of these menus items where we have different symbols to where you can select them in 3D and then be able to, to view it. Um, one of the harder things is smoke. We currently create it from the simulation, but it's not based on existing smoke models. And that's some of our future work. And that's an important part of viewing a fire as really real. Uh, and we want to f come up with a coupled model with smoke modeling in the future. So as we started, one of my graduate students said, let me see if I can do some basic smoke. And I don't know if you can see the number on the bottom. There's a frames per second. And it's running between 45 and 60 down there. Uh, but as we come to some smoke, there are some spotted fires. We're going to start seeing, as, as he was trying some particle systems, we have some hardware issues as to what graphics cards can do. And it starts slowing down as we get closer. We'll start, you see the number bounced. We're at 4150. It went back up to 60. And as we get too many things, it's going to drop down into the 30s. And once we get below 30 frames per second, you start noticing some jerkiness. For those students who play games, that's when there's issues, right? So, so we have to make sure we keep things going well. Um, so, so we were playing with different types of smoke, and this was an issue where we're dropping actually down into the low 30s. We hit a 20s a couple times as we came through the smoke. And that causes problems with believability. Um, now, I mentioned that we built a, three, a cave. Uh, basically, a cave is a room that's three meters on a side. You can kind of see the uh, corners of the room. Let's see if I can move my mouse over here. There's a corner down here, and there's a corner back here behind Dan. And you can see the top corners. We have the back wall off, so we can actually just take a picture in. Uh, we were doing development. We have a four-sided cave and a six-sided cave. The four-sided does not have a roof. And so Roger was doing some preliminary development in the four-sided. This one doesn't have the roof, where we can actually do uh, fire visualization. Um, this was some of Roger's dissertation work. He now works for Google. doing. He's been working on Google Mars and a few things like that with him. Um, we were able to add some interfaces to where we can start fires. These guys were having too much fun by firing, starting fires all over the place with their laser guns. 
And then we can do the interfaces where we have the fire burning and pause it to then start doing some of the interaction. That's where it starts getting fun because we can do some training with it and then start the fires from there on. Let's see, I have a video clip. Let's see if I can do some. Is that hearable? I'm not sure what I can. Okay. Nope. Whole goal was to do training and be able to put people in the simulation. These are people I work with, some of my students that I've worked with. Um, and Tom has been working with me on some of these pieces. So the whole goal is can we get to a place where you, we can put people who have to combat the fire into this so they can try stuff. Um, because our next step is going to be audio. And that's ironic that I can't get the audio to actually show you. But um, I'm trying to, but I don't know where the speaker is. Is that better? So, so we have an issue with the basic acoustics. As, as a fire burns, when it starts small, it kind of just crackles. But when it gets big and comes by you, it can be really roaring. It also creates its own wind and weather, which is an intriguing piece. <clears throat> so our next step is to start working on some better flames, because flames are really computationally intensive. They can mess with the computer graphics pieces of it. But we've been working on some fractal base with Perlin fires. As we change some basic parameters, we can change what the flame looks like, and the computation is identical. So it's really fast, and we're able to start taking it. This is our next major piece that we're going to be doing. And we're playing with what the parameters look like better, so we can start doing some different stuff to visualize it a lot better. My students like to work on games. Um, and they like to build games, because some of them go on to work in the gaming industry. <clears throat> but I get them to try things like this, when they think they're building it for a game, and then I can use it for some of the good stuff uh, that I do. So this is kind of nice. So some of our potential scenarios are to do some training. If you've ever seen people dealing with forest fires, they talk, come back and talk once a night on the press, right? They talk on the TV. And they usually have this thing called a sandbox right here. And they, show, they have a map kind of, and they show you where the fire is. Imagine if they could automatically have the visualization of it done. That's where it becomes a better thing, because we can do public information output. Because sometimes they have to burn the grass on the ground, but not the trees. And people get scared because it's a controlled burn, but they're trying to do things nicely. Um, we also have some scenarios for education where we can do some and train some poli policymakers and insurance companies. What can we do to help mitigate fire issues? So those are the places that we're going. We've done a lot of visualization of it. Um, and fortunately, I don't ha couldn't get all my videos I wanted for today, but I was happy that we could get some of these. So thank you for the people who helped me download them. Um, so thank you. This forest fire simulation and visualization. Any questions?